Okay, so next up we have a panel titled Unleashing the Power of Decentralized Identity, which I think will be a good one. Uh, on this panel we have three guests, Arthur from Linea, Slobo from Namestone, and Paul from 3DNS. So help me welcome them to the stage, please. Okay, cool. We will try to follow up Vitalik, but um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And so, uh, instead of introing these guys myself, I'm just going to start with a question where you guys could maybe describe what you're working on and stuff. Basically, what are you building and why did you choose to build it on ENS? We could start with you, Paul. Hey guys, uh, my name's Paul. I'm the, the founder of 3DNS. For those of you that don't know what we're doing at 3DNS, we're doing uh, on-chain domain names. Um, that are ICANN compliant, so we're the first uh, on-chain on ICANN accredited domain name registrar. Um, I started it about you know, a year and a half or two ago as a way to you know, take ENS names, integrate them into traditional you know, Web2 names, and, and try to bridge the gap between ENS and DNS. Um, we launched the first fully on-chain uh, TLD with intercap.box, um, and now are pretty focused on just building out different use cases to, you know, show people what you can do with, you know, these on-chain uh, RWAs and so on. And real quick, for people that might not know, uh, what is ICANN and, like, why is 3DNS and, and I guess, .box and, and what you mentioned unique compared to other domain systems? Yeah, ICANN is the governing body for uh, domain names, right? So anything that you type into a browser, right, .coms, .nets, .orgs, um, those go to root name servers, and then they go and they resolve, right, that, that uh, website that you see, right? So, so ICANN approves um, and has a ton of different rules and regulations around basically making the internet accessible, right? They're, they're pretty focused on... Um, how just non-technical users can do it, right? So in doing so, we've, we've had to, you know, bridge a lot of gaps with uh, the complexities of crypto um, to make it so that, that you know, it's, it's less scary and it's reliable and it's user-friendly and, and just works. Sweet. And uh, Slobo, uh, what are you building and why on ENS? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Slobo.eth, uh, that's the name I go by because uh, that's the way I view myself. I've discarded Alex because I don't think that name is uh, immutable and fully mine, where Slobo.eth is. I am the founder of Namestone.xyz, uh, which makes subnames easy uh, for ENS, and we basically take CCIP read technology, uh, wrap it into a REST uh, API that uh, any dev can use and spin up subnames super easy. And it's important because um, ENS is like multiple layers and the easier it gets, the more people are gonna use it. And uh, lots of po powerful use cases are possible because of it. Um, and really ENS, uh, Namestone is able to be, uh, is, is able to give a lot of uh, ability for developers. Awesome, and now Arthur. Hey everybody, so Arthur. Um, I'm product manager at Linea, uh, so ZKEVM uh, chain layer two. And one of the multiple things that we are doing is like uh, creating some building blocks for identity. And so uh, the, on the ENS side, what we build is the li Linea names, which is sub subdomains for, for Linea, fully trustless, fully compatible with ENS, where basically any, anywhere ENS resolve, we are resolving too. And so uh, yeah, like as Vitalik described uh, very well in this talk, like it makes ENS uh, domain super affordable. We have uh, increasing adoption, right? Uh, 400,000 names at the moment. It's one of the things that we are doing. And then we have al also overbuilding blocks where we hope that protocols uh, will help uh, create the next use case around identity on linear. So our proof of humanity system, which we, we use for uh, enabling uh, Civil resistance across the chain, but especially for ENS because uh, on, on linear names, like domains are free for users, except like the few cents you, you pay for the gas fees. Uh, and there is Verax as well, which is our attestation registry. I uh, like to call this uh, the NFT on steroids for credential badges uh, and 
our proof of humanity system is basically all managed on, on Verax and all transparent. Very cool. And always fun to have uh, a non-North American accent on the stage as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nice. And so we have three different products that range obviously pretty vastly. But um, next question would be, how are people using your products today? And I think more interestingly, what are some unexpected or just like unique use cases that you didn't really expect when creating it, uh, but just caught your eye as like, oh, that's, that's cool. And maybe we'll just go the same direction down. Yeah, that's a, a good question, right? It's, it's how are people actually, you know, using what, what we're building, right? So 3DNS is, is tokenizing traditional domain names. So uh, the most kind of obvious answer or the, the simplest use case is just traditional websites. Um, there's a lot of friction with uh, traditional domain names, um, especially around, you know, buying a domain name that somebody else owns, um, right? So crypto kind of unlocks a lot of... Um, easier rails for how you can, you know, sell and buy a domain name, right, as an NFT. They work on, right, marketplaces. Um, so that the traditional, you know, two to, to like 16 week uh, transaction times for buying a domain name through traditional escrow services, um, you know, now can be reduced down to, to you know, minutes or, or even less. Um, and then, uh, a lot of like interesting kind of use cases that you know we're focused on um, and and playing around with right are are how do you you know take these domain names that are also you know identities and are um, you know addresses where where money can be forwarded and and how do you turn them into like you know on chain or digital businesses right so so that's kind of like a big thing that that kind of excites us now. Um, and you know we're we're looking forward to kind of building that out more. Nice, yeah. Escrow is a very natural use case of smart contracts, and so cool to see it come to I guess a unique market. Uh, Slobo, any unexpected ways that people are using your products out in the wild? Yeah, so I think the most interesting use case I've seen is because ENS lets you have a kind of website associated with it through a content hash. Uh, we had one uh, client who use the exact same address for all the names, like their ETH address, but the website was different and it was more like managing their deploy schedule. To be honest, I still don't understand it, but it's sort of like, I think that's actually the, the cool stuff is, I've never expected people to just lean into that decentralized website component of ENS, and if it's gasless, I'm sure Vitalik said, you know, it costs him $3. If he used a gasless solution, uh, it would be less, probably wrong vibes. But the, the point is, it, it's like, there's so much capabilities of ENS and just making it gasless or, or cheap um, just makes people be creative and that's what I, I love to see. Very cool. Yeah, I think content hash is an aspect of ENS. For those of you who don't know, it allows you to store some sort of decentralized content along with an ENS name, whether it's an on-chain ENS name like a .eth or off-chain. And so off-chain ENS names that have a content hash um, it's just something that we don't see much of. And so cool to see that people are building that out with your products. Um, and now, Arthur, any unique ways that people have been using linear names? Yeah, so all, all that we are doing basically is open source, at least all that I described, right? And actually, we documented and we welcome like, people to build on it. And so that has created some interesting things. So linear names, it's based on the C CCIP stack, right? CCIP read, to be precise. And so we saw multiple protocols starting to use it for, for some use case. So there is the Liber Free team, uh, which is basically, uh, I, I love the use case, they are creating a decentralized library, library to download free books. I think at some point, and maybe it's still, it's still the case, they were the biggest uh, issuer of uh, ENS names actually, because uh, they want uh, to use the ENS name to have like a immutable or at least a decentralized pointer to each, each book. And uh, people are minting it. Uh, it was on uh, the layer one, which was a bit costly. And so they fully migrated to, to Linea to manage this. Uh, so that has been a fun use case. Uh, we have a, a cool, uh, cool NFT collection as well on, on Linea, which is called eFrogs. And basically, they fork the stack and know like each NFT holder, like say you are 1122 eFrog. Uh, now you can have uh, your 1122.ifrags.if uh, that resolves to your address and 
if it's a transfer, like the name will be transferred with them, with it, or at least the resolution. So that was a cool use case. Same thing for the proof of humanity that I described, like at some point, I mean, civil resistance is a big problem in the space. So we are putting all the data on chain free for everybody to use. And so we have like uh, just teams uh, that uh, decided to take this uh, data to do their own airdrop, for instance, instead of like re relying to like pay paid services to identify Sybil, for instance, so, yeah. Very cool, it's like you created a consumer tool, you open sourced it, and then developers are now using it to build their own consumer tools with your code. And I think that's just like such a fun thing that happens in crypto that really just doesn't happen in other places. So really cool to hear. And I guess um, getting a, a bit more technical, you, you were talking about CCIP read and the verification and stuff like that. Uh, I guess why did you guys feel it was important to do it, that approach what was kind of the, the process that uh, you went about when you were building it? Maybe some learnings from it. I think just like that is very unique and you guys were the first uh, layer two to do that at scale. So I think it's worth highlighting. Yeah, so basically the way CCIP read is that as Vitalik described, you have a L1 contract that will revert and ask a gateway to fetch information somewhere for, for the contract. So it can be off chain, but it can be on a layer two, right? The thing is that uh, like, you can trust the gateway, right? But it's not uh, decentralized and you, ha you have like a risk of the gateway just sending like junk inf information. So what we did actually, like as all roll up, like uh, Linea is backed by zero knowledge proof, right? And the state is uh, settled on L1. So uh, basically that means that our gateway is fetching the information, who owns the domain, but also fetching like um, Merkel proof so that then when the gateway responds to the L1 contract, uh, it gives the proof and the L1 contract is able to verify this proof against like the linear state that is posted on L1. So that makes it like fully trustless. And if you are, it's a very, very important point because if you don't have that, basically you can get rug anytime. You have to trust the gateway. So you might assume like gateways are uh, like trusted in some case if it's like big L2s and so on, but they can still be compromised by hack. Uh, so you really need your name to, to be uh, like fully decentralized. And uh, otherwise, like any transfer, like when you resolve your name, like they can send a junk address and you will just lose the funds that are sent to you. So it's really important. Yeah, so it's like using off-chain infrastructure in order to scale things, but not relying on it fully and not trusting it fully. Uh, so it's like, if the gateway was compromised and tried to lie, uh, a contract on Ethereum, L1, would basically know that you're trying to lie and uh, invalidate the result. So it's just, uh, I, I think, a super unique and, and cool use case and a good implementation uh, for what we want to see more of going forward, as Vitalik mentioned and as we mentioned earlier as well. Um, cool. So, Paul, last time we talked in Singapore, I learned that 3DNS isn't actually the first majorly impactful thing that you've built on ENS. Um, do you want to share a little bit about the, the previous one or maybe one of the previous ones? Yeah, bef before I started um, 3DNS, I helped build uh, CB.ID back at uh, Coinbase. Um, so CB.ID is actually the largest uh, issuer of, of um, ENS names. I think there's about, there's, there's 10 or 12 million subdomains that have that have been done now right and and that was kind of what opened my eyes up first to um, kind of the impact that identity has on um, applications right when we were doing that back at um, coinbase we learned a lot about how it impacted you know retention and and ease of access um, just to users in in crypto right if you gave them a subdomain or if you gave them a way to make their like wallet and address more personable. Um, they, they felt a lot more comfortable and they'd, they'd come back to the app more often, um, right? So that was kind of like, that was I guess how you could say my ENS journey, you know, started. I mean, I, I had a dot ETH name before, right? But it was, it was, it was really, um, that was like when I started building, building in the space. Nice, yeah, so it's like, you started building CB.ID at Coinbase, which is now probably the most uh, impactful onboarding experience that people have had with ENS. Like, there's this personal story that I like to tell, where um, 
my mom's friend wanted an NFT that I created for something, and I asked her to send her address, which was really weird, and I didn't expect that she'd actually know what that meant and send something, and she sent me her CB.ID name. And I was like, oh, this is perfect because when I ask somebody to send their wallet info to receive something, they just they understood the name right away. Uh, and that was thanks to Coinbase and CB.ID. So it's cool to see that you were part, you played a part in building that and are still continuing to like iterate on ENS and build more impactful things. So nice to have you around. <laughs> thanks. That's no, that's super cool to hear. It is it is pretty crazy how um small crypto is. Right, even though like it's it's been around for a while now, um, how, how many people still don't like understand? You know these these crazy kind of deep weeds that we're in every day. But um, but you know we got to make it more accessible. Um, and ENS really right pioneered that. So. Love it. Um, cool. And now Slobo, I know for you, similar to myself, when you were getting into crypto. Uh, there are a lot of things that were just like maybe wishy-washy, not super exciting, and ENS just was one of the first things to really stick. Um, oh, why, why was that, and do you still kind of agree with your initial findings there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I got into, like I've been aware of crypto for a long time, and then to me I come from fintech, and it seemed like magic money, and usually magic money means scam. Uh, so I just like avoided it to my own financial detriment. Uh, but that's neither here or there. Uh, somehow, someone sent me an article on ENS, and I went and I registered, and I was so confused with the double transactions, um, and it, it's like I'm waiting 60 seconds. I didn't understand why. Um, but then when I got it, I went to OpenSea, and I logged in, and all of a sudden, uh, my name, Slobo.eth, populated cross app, and I'm like, holy crap, this is, this is structurally better than what web two can deliver, it will win. And like that was the single light bulb moment that drove my involvement for ENS and will continue to drive it. So whenever I get, uh, whenever the narratives get uh, shaky, uh, I kind of go back to that feeling and even just like retelling the story now is just, that's the thing, it's my identity, it's my name. I don't need to go to all these different services to, um, you know, like get Slobo here and there, it's mine and any app that builds on it, I get to bring the right amount of reputation with it. So it, it's, and it's so simple that even when you are like a novice in crypto, you just get it. And the last point uh, is when I try to explain anything in crypto to my family or like my mother, I find that ENS is the easiest thing to explain because I say, hey mom, you have a uh, login for Instagram and you have a login for Facebook but uh, uh, how great would it be if you just had one? And she just instantly gets it, even though she's never used Slack. Um, so that's, um, that's why I just love ENS, and I want to make it easy for other people to have that experience. And with uh, L2 primary names coming, I think uh, that's going to be the thing that kind of triggers it for everybody uh, and all those, all those entities. Yeah, I think that's... A perfect answer and uh, like goes along with the, the title here of unleashing the power of decentralized identity. It's like once you realize the power of decentralized identity and that ENS is this universal profile really across the internet, um, that's really just what clicks. And so I had a similar experience, but always cool to hear other perspectives. Um, cool. So we talked about good things about decentralized identity uh, and like good progress, but what are some of the biggest issues that you maybe see or feel or hear about in the space, um, in the space today, whether it's from your projects that you've learned or, or others. Yeah, I think I think there's there's two big things that are you know top of mind there, right? One is still the the technical kind of barrier, right? How do you onboard non crypto users, like non technical users, um, to using these products? Um, and then the other ones, you know, like why. Why, why should they use these, right? So there's, there's kind of like two things we look at there, right? And that's like, how do you kind of add value, you know, to what you're building? But then also like, how do you make it accessible? Um, you know, obviously everybody loves the smart contract wallets. Um, I think that the big thing for me there is, is pass key integration, right? We've actually seen the Web2 industry um, normalize the, the concept of pass keys, which I think it, like does us a massive favor um, with, you know, smart contract wallets, right? If we can get users comfortable using 
um, different you know, password managers and using a pass key, okay, well now we can give them a crypto wallet in a way in which they don't know it's a crypto wallet. Um, so I think that's one side, right? And then the other side is like, like okay, why, why should something be on chain is, is another big question, right? A lot of people are like, oh, like, like tokenize it, but like what does tokenizing it actually do? Um, so I think like one of the things that really excites me about, you know, kind of bridging ENS names with domain names um, is like your ENS name is a payout address, right? So it's like, hey, where do you send my money? Your domain name is like, hey, what's your real estate or like, like how do you actually view, um, you know, this business online? It's, it's something that you can share. And I think like this, this final step is like how do you now tie another asset to it um, so that you can actually like create these you know digital businesses that produce yield that's you know not just financial stuff from like loans and lending assets and and like derivatives and so on like I think I think that's kind of the the big next step for crypto and and the whole identity space is is like how do we bring other money into the ecosystem um, and you know, kind of open up non-financial use cases. Yeah, in there you mentioned one of the hardest questions to answer sometimes is like, why bring things on chain? Uh, and not to, not to grill you, but if somebody were to say, why should I register a domain name with 3DNS on chain instead of with Namecheap? Uh, what, what's kind of like one or two points that you might have? And one of them, I'm sure, is the just like on-chain liquidity type of thing. Uh, but curious to hear any other ideas? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a good one, right? It's um, so there's there's a couple things there, right? We launched uh, ENS on Optimism. Um, Optimism's an out two. The big reason that we did that is because you know gas fees are a massive barrier to entry for like users, right? Not only do you have to explain like a wallet, but then you have to explain that they have to spend this money just to like do something, um, right? So. So when we kind of come back to your question of like, hey, why should a domain name be tokenized, right? Why would you register one with 3DNS first, like go to your name cheap? Um, I think the big thing is it's like domains were in many ways the OG NFT. Um, they're a digital real world asset that people have traded and kind of like assigned value to for a long time. Um, and they control like such an integral part of people's business, right? It's the, the presence online. Um, so I think the, the crypto primitives make a lot of sense there um, because it's, I want an auditable trail of you know, where my website points. I want to make sure that nobody can change those DNS records. I want to attach different financial information associated with my business. Um, and then it just, just makes it easier to transact, right? Like if I'm going to buy a domain from you, there's no reason we should need a third party to escrow it. We should need to wait a couple weeks to be able to send money, right? So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's crypto was a very natural kind of like use case for domains because of that. Um, and, you know, it'll, it'll only get better. Good answer. <laughs> uh, Slobo. Same question. What do you see as the biggest challenge for decentralized identity today? Yeah, I think people just don't realize they need identities. I think it's education uh, because people know usernames. They know they have these logins, uh, but I don't think they actually realize what it is. And I think if they did, um, they would be much more inclined to really own it because you, you don't realize you're attached to a name like there's a story of multiple people on X whose name was taken. And if your name is never taken, you just kind of assume you own it. And it's not until it's taken from you and you're deprived of it, which happens really rarely to the credit of Web2. You almost, it's, it's a great system for 99.9% .9 of the people. But when it messes up, it doesn't work. So it's sort of like those people are instantly converted to like a digital like self-sovereign identity. But how do you convert the people uh, without hurting them <laughs> to begin with, right? It's like if we can just rug every Web2 name, then it'll be an easy sell. But I don't know if that's the right societal uh, balance there. <laughs> so That's a good point. It's almost hard to feel the value until you're forced to in some ways. So it's like uh, the, the, edu the education part is definitely sometimes difficult there. Um, Arthur, same, same question. What do you see as the biggest challenge for decentralized identity today? 
Yeah, so I will try to complement both answers, but like first, it's like convenience. We like we touched on that. Like you were confused the first time you bought a ENS, like two transactions, like high fees and so on. Like we are not putting like uh, the normies uh, on, on it with this. So hopefully, like solution on L2 L help with that, but it's not over, right? Like even uh, on L2, you need like funds uh, like to do the transaction and so on. Hopefully we will solve that soon, but like uh, it's something that uh, we as an industry still uh, need to work on a lot. Um, the second one that I touch uh, upon a bit is like what I c we call like tr trustlessness. Really, you don't want any weak link Otherwise, it's not a decentralized identity. Like, I I really love like CB dot ID. I think it's fantastic, but it's not something where you can build your full identity around because like people can uh, just uh, take it away from you. Like Twitter, you can get the platform. It's the same thing. So we really need a system which is uh, from A to Z fully decentralized. Like th those are like the two main points I would say. So like one thing I want to add is like I, I love that there are different kind of grades of ENS that's possible, fully trustless to like fully controlled. And I think most people need multiple of them and you need the right identity for the right use case. If I'm downloading a new wallet, I don't want to necessarily have an on-chain identity and I don't really care that it could be like rugged uh, for 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 that perspective. But in other times, like you were saying, just like you want that to be cheap and unruggable. Yeah. I totally agree. Like it was not like uh, at all to discard. It, I'm, the only thing I'm saying is that if you want to build like one unique strong DID, like it needs to be fully decentralized. But if you, it's just a way to like point to any way like your own Coinbase. So like it, it makes sense, right, to have this uh, CB.ID. That's uh, that's fine as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, make a very contrarian uh, statement here and. And that it's um, you know our our DIDs should be fully decentralized from a administrative standpoint, um, but not from a resolution standpoint. Right? I, I think you do need some sort of right. Everybody's gonna hate me for this. You do need some sort of uh, censorship, right? And you do need some sort of like user protection, right? If you look at um, I can, and I think what's like really interesting here that people will slowly like learn more about is um, different TODs have different rules around what names can be pulled, right? And for users that really care, if they, they look at that, like some are very vague and ambiguous and, and other ones aren't, right? So what's really cool about the box um, TOD is that it's, it's a very clear list, right? Like, hey, you can't do um, like, you know, you, you can't do stuff related to uh, like child pornography or like very explicitly illicit things. Um, but beyond that, right, it's like, okay, if you, you know, host your own site or you have like anything that, that falls outside of the terms of use, you know, it's, it's totally fine, right? So it's, it's kind of this tricky balance of like how decentralized do you want things to be versus not. Um, because there are good reasons for putting kind of rails in place. Um, but I do think like the trustless resolution of addresses needs to be a standard everywhere because if, if I get so used to typing in, you know, like a, a name, an ENS name, and then like the address switches, the user's not going to know the address switched, right? So like that needs to be um, locked down. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a great point, right? Like the the resolution is the safety mechanism, but obviously the asset is kind of can be separated from it. So, makes sense to me. Cool. Basically, options are good, and ENS allows options. Um, nice. We are just about out of time here, but I want to give each of you a quick minute uh, to kind of plug what you're working on. What's next? How can people find you online? Uh, and then we'll end it there. Yeah, you can uh, you can find us online by going to 3dns.box um, and just you know registering domain names, and then we're just building out a ton of different uh, use cases. Right now, we're focused on on subdomains, right? So how do you you know um, do
do you know branded subdomains, make them specific to you know your your kind of application as as usernames, um, right? So like like how do I integrate subdomains directly into my app, but have those subdomains be ENS names that then users can um, export? Um, and then you know we're we're playing around with this concept of like named NFTs, um, which is like how do you now tie those to on-chain assets? Um, but yeah, you know, you can you can check us out by by going to 3 dnsbox and you know registering a name. Awesome, Slipper. Yeah, um, if you if any developer wants to issue uh, gasless subnames, go to namestone.xyz, uh, get an API key and start issuing it today. For example, uh, devcon.id is issuing subnames uh, using the Namestone product, and so far it's worked pretty well. So. That's it, and the future is just making it better and faster. And so, yeah, you, you can go to linab.build, our website. You will uh, see a full instruction if you want to create subnames on, uh, on Linea, if you want to leverage our proof of humanity system as well. And Ver Verax is like community and open source based, so like building in the open uh, with several contributors, so you can go there as well. So it's VER. Dot AX, uh, so feel free to check out. Awesome, and I'll add a final plug that Arthur and I are giving a more technical workshop about CCIP read uh, or EIP 3668 on Wednesday uh, at the main DevCon venue. I don't know the exact time, but you can find it on the DevCon schedule. So if you're into that sort of stuff, uh, I hope to see you there. But thanks for joining me, and we'll hand it back to Catherine. <laughs>